Dr. Shannon McLean, Program Lead, Risk Reduction and Resilience in NASA Disaster Program. Mr. James Rodriguez, Public Relations Officer, and other USA Embassy personnel, fellow commissioner, girls, good evening. Good evening. So everybody knows why we're here today, right? So everybody knows why we're here today, right? Yes. Okay, let's try this again. So does everybody know why we're here today? Yes. <laughs> really? Wow. Well, I am very pleased and excited to be here today for the Girls in STEM presentation to be made by Dr. Shannon McLean. I am pleased to see so many girls and young women here as you do participants from the two smallest sections of the association, the Girl Guides and the Senior Section. But I personally am ecstatic, ecstatic sorry, because I so wanted to be an astronaut, although Dr. McLean says she will not be able to answer all my astronaut questions, but she will try. And I was constantly told that a little girl from Barbados could never be one. It just would not be possible. But I believed that I could, despite the naysayers, until reality set in. And I settled for being an economist. <laughs> but you never know, you just never know, had I been afforded this opportunity that you ladies have today, I may have been on an entirely different trajectory. But now I get to interface with and hear someone who works at NASA although she's not an astronaut. But wow, nevertheless, NASA, yeah. I never thought that that would actually happen. And now to see that you young ladies will be given the chance that I didn't have all those years ago, that's just cool, that's just excellent for me. That's not to say that we do and did not have girls and women in the STEM workforce and that it has not been accepted. It's just that persons have been speaking out more and engaging and trying to empower girls and young women to move more into STEM related areas and promoting the belief that they can be anything they want to be and do anything they want to do, scientists included. When the association was approached to host this session, I immediately consented, as there are a number of girls and young women, as we can see here, who although having an interest in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, do not always have the avenue, sorry, or opportunity to hear about or interact with persons who are in the various fields or who have even reached certain levels of the said fields as often as they would like. So we thought this would be an excellent time to seize this chance. These do not come along very often on our small island, as you know. So it is at this time, I will say a great big welcome to all of you, but in particular to Dr. McLean, to not just Barbados, but to the Girl Guys Association of Barbados. I trust that your words will encourage the young ladies here to tap into a whole new world, and thus reach and even surpass their wildest dreams and potential. potential sorry. So once again, welcome. Thank you. All right, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good. All right. So I'm with the U.S. Embassy. I'm the public affairs officer, James Rodriguez. And one of the things that one of our priorities as a mission is to increase the amount of women in STEM. Who knows what STEM stands for? There you go, there you go. And who is going, who is thinking about entering one of those fields as a career? Yes, good, good. As the father of three daughters, oh, one of which looks like is going to be a scientist, which I'm happy about. One of them is gonna be an artist, which worries me though. Um, <laughs> I, I, I really, I, this is something very personal to me, and this is something that I'd love to see more young women get interested in, get involved in, and make a career out of, uh, career out of. Because you guys really do bring a different perspective to the community, to wherever you're gonna work, and that's absolutely necessary. So, without, I don't, I don't wanna talk too much more. I'm just gonna say thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope that you're gonna get a lot out of the presentation and ask a lot of questions. This is a conversation, this isn't a lecture. So please ask questions. And with that, Dr. Shana, there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. So James is right. Um, what I want to do is talk with all of you today, not talk at you. So if there's something that I'm saying that's of interest to you along the way, or that you want more information about, just let me know. Raise your hand. Um, you know, and let's have a discussion about you know how I work at NASA, how I got there, um, and. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about um, you know how I started out too, um, because I think um, I came from 
a family where I'm the first in my, in my family to not only get a degree, but certainly to get a doctoral degree, and also who decided that I could uh, do science without really having a family that understood what exactly I was trying to do. You know, they, they thought I was a little crazy sometimes, especially because school can take some time to get through, you know, but, but if you have ambition and you have support, um, I think a lot of these things make it, uh, especially today, a uh, possibility. So thank you all for spending part of your day with me. I'm really excited to be here. And just to start, this is me um, in water and at my happiest, which is kind of how I started out. I'm right here in my sunglasses. <laughs> Um, ever since I was a little girl, I loved water. I loved the oceans. I grew up in Miami, Florida. I was always on the beach. I was scuba diving. I was snorkeling. I loved fish. I loved just being a part of nature. Um, I also loved lakes and, and rivers and being able to just be a part of nature. And I think I recognized really early on that, you know, that we have a, a, a connection, right? I mean, we need water. Um, but I think we also need to be a part of nature, um, to be happy and to really understand how we connect and how we're connected um, to, uh, you know, it's supplying food and different things for us. Um, and so I think similar to maybe some of the rules that you guys have to follow within your group, I felt it was my role to protect, to protect nature and to make sure that I was protecting a system that I felt was really important. And so when I got out of high school, I, um, I started a bachelor's degree in environmental science. And so with environmental science, you learn a lot of chemistry and biology and math and engineering. And it teaches you about how environmental systems work, like more broadly. And from there, um, when you get your bachelor's degree, you, you study a lot. It's a lot of like really broad kind of things, but eventually, if you move on to a master's or a PhD, you start really honing into the things that you care about specifically. Um, sometimes it's such a narrow perspective that some, you know, it's a little too narrow, but for what I hope to do, um, I moved on from my bachelor's and get, went to get a master's on looking how water and humans uh, how we as a population or community would manage water and then eventually my PhD added the disaster element and that's really what I'm going to talk today uh, with all of you about because I work for the earth science division of NASA but specifically in their disasters program and so all of the the chemistry and the biology and the engineering kind of came together where as an environmental scientist, I'm able to help NASA understand the impacts of disasters on both the environment, but also on people like us. And I think our primary goal, um, NASA has a larger mandate just to explore and, and the unknown and have it help the benefit, like to the benefit of humankind. But what I'm trying to do with our program is have us better understand how the science that we do can help save lives, either by pre preventing or preparing for a disaster, or by better responding or recovering from disasters. So when people are in settings like this, we want to be able to get the information to emergency responders and other groups of people, the information they need in order to make smart decisions. So I'm going to talk a little bit to you about like how we see the different types of information that can inform decision making. Is everybody with me so far? Do you have any questions? Are we good? Okay. So one of the ways that we look at Earth as a system to see a changing environment is through the International Space Station. Have any of you heard of the International Space Station before? Yeah? Do you know what's on the International Space Station? Anybody been there? <laughs> yeah, has anybody visited the International Space Station? <laughs> Not yet, right? So on the International Space Station are at any given time about six astronauts. It is, a, it is the only uh, currently manned space operation that we run. Um, it's run, it's managed by NASA, but it's jointly uh, run by a number of other um, agencies to essentially promote diplomacy with other countries like the European Union, Russia, and others. And so 
Um, I think one of the astronauts up there right now is Russian as well. There's usually people from different parts of the world um, reflecting on the different countries involved up on the station. And they do really cool science. Um, a lot of them are looking, the astronauts that are there, live there for a short time because the effects from space can be pretty rough on you. Um, but they, they try to see if they can grow crops in gra um, with a zero gravity. And they try to also see if the types of bacteria that we see here on Earth are somehow impacted differently in space. But what they also do is sit in a, something called a cupola which allows for, there's different windows, and the astronauts can sit out, sit there, and take pictures of the Earth from space. And so it provides us with a lot of images that we wouldn't get otherwise. Because satellite data sometimes produces more synthetic, like, uh, data or images that we have to, to make sense of or analyze ourselves. It's not as clear as a picture is, which is what these astronauts are giving to us. So for example, we can see something like this from an astronaut in the International Space Station. <clears throat> so of course this is a picture of where we are all today, right? And um, from here, if you get these pictures from the astronauts over time, you can see changes happen, right? Like you can see whether there's development in certain areas. A lot of the images, you can see the beaches here and the shelves of the, uh, you know, before we drop off into the deeper ocean and even certain boats while they're there. But when um, a rain happens, if we take pictures after, you can see a lot of the runoff start to change the way that we see your local community. And it's these changes that, I, that influence the way that I see um, our environment. One of the ways that you can all participate in looking up at the International Space Station is to go online to how I spot the station. So even though we have a, a group of astronauts that are up in space looking down at each of you, if you're interested in really exploring you know, how, to, how to look up and document um, different things that you see, you can look up from where you are in Barbados and find a time and date and find where the International Space Station is gonna be up in uh, low Earth orbit. You can take pictures of this, you can tweet about it or add it to Facebook. There's a whole community that tries to spot the International Space Station. And part of science, of course, is always like looking and observing and taking account and stock of what's around you. So I'm now gonna move into other types of satellites that give us the other, like additional information. So the International Space Station is giving me specific photos of how their Earth changes, but satellites orbit our Earth along with their International Space Station, but these are all unmanned satellites. They fly usually in a train of connected satellites so that we can get from all of the satellites as they move across the Earth the same kind of information from the same locations, but each of the different satellites that you see here, there are 22 in total, are gonna give us different types of uh, an understanding of the Earth. So in some cases, we can see um, with this data, the Cygnus data, these tell us the movement of wind across the ocean so that we can understand the movement of waves on a coastline. So if there's a tsunami, we'll, we'll be able to see that and understand it. Um, Landsat here can tell us about changing agricultural activities. So if you've planted a certain crop one season and you wanna understand what it means like over time to whether there's drought, if it affects the crops, or you know if farmers are moving where they plant. These are um, satellites that can tell you these different types of things. We can also see hurricanes. And we can see when they are moving in a direction that's going to impact certain communities. And so this image is usually pretty well known. I don't know if, um, have any of you seen this picture before of the hurricanes? This is from 2017. So this is Harvey as it's moving towards Texas, Irma, and Maria as it's affecting the Caribbean. And <clears throat> another thing that we can see with satellites is not just the movement of the hurricanes across the ocean and the direction that they're taking before they make impact, 
but we also get to see um, areas where the lights are on. You know, and what this means usually, I mean, we can tell like where cities are, so you can see um, some of the islands here and here, and parts of Mexico and Central America, and then all the lights of, of Florida, including where Miami is here, and Fort Lauderdale. So these are dense populations. And what we really care about, I mean, on one hand, it's really neat to see something like this, but what happens after the hurricane? What we're able to see is where the lights were on before it, and then when they went out. And so what that tells us is something about vulnerability. That means that a particular population was left without electricity for an extended period of time. And we can actually measure the amount of time people don't have electricity. That means that they're not able to cook food, or boil water, or take showers that are hot. It means that if they're reliant upon some sort of medical uh, dialysis machine or other thing, that they don't have access to that either. So it gives us a better understanding of what populations are not only not able to access their basic services, but then it can tell on the flip side, people who are providing generators where they need to go first or where the telecommunications, like your phone systems, need to be turned on because people aren't able to make calls out for emergency. When the river, when the hurricane is moving past, we can see the changes in rivers. So as they're growing and swelling and toppling over their embankment, we know not only that the river itself is changing, but that we can see where the communities are located so that we can say to which ones need maybe to be considerate of whether there will be flooding in the region, you know, whether your house will be underwater, um, and whether you need to evacuate certain areas. Particularly, we can see flood depth. So not just where the water goes, which is the extent of the water, but then how deep it is. So that when we want to plan for future events, like where we build houses, the set keeps changing on me, so I apologize. <laughs> um, when we um, want to build houses in certain areas, we know that based on past storms, that houses here are underwater completely, whereas houses up here are up high enough, were built with enough elevation to withstand a certain height of flooding. It also tells us, because you can see where the water is here and here, that these are all roads. So if we're trying to get people out to evacuate an area, it helps us understand where they should go, which roads they should take, or even if we need to give emergency services, how to get them most quickly to the places that they need to get to. And finally, one of the things that we can see is the change in the way land is impacted by things like hurricanes. Because not only with hurricanes do you see a lot of water, and heavy rains and flooding, you also see a lot of impact from wind. So most of <clears throat> the vegetation that's been lost, so this was before and this is after, so not only are the houses gone, but you also see areas where the trees and the grasses and other things are no longer there. So and again, it helps inform whether or not we should decide to rebuild in this region or whether or not we need to use different types of materials and how they withstood. You know, I mean, in some cases, you can see certain houses still standing. You can start to ask questions like, well, did they use a different material from the ones that collapsed? And is that something that we should consider the next time around? So all of these different types of information and data are the things that I use to try to inform how we make decisions about saving human lives, how to prepare for disasters, and how, how we can also start to learn how to build back better and recover in a more smart or um, intelligent way. And before I talk and move on to the next section, does anybody have any questions about any of the data or things that I've reviewed? Yeah. Have you ever received photos of like, say, 4th of July or New Year's Day, we have like fireworks in the sky? Yeah. Yeah, some of those are really exciting, actually. Um, we have, NASA has an entire um, kind of uh, website that's dedicated to uh, things that I think the public are going to use, like, you know, for 
celebrating different things or seeing some of the, the more the prettier parts of the data that we have. Um, so maybe not something like this, but if you go to earthobservatory.org for NASA, um, then you can start to see some of the pictures that we have of people celebrating um, throughout the world, um, fireworks, but also you know different uh, New Year's celebrations where there's lanterns that are um, flown up, floated up into the sky that are you know lit down on the ground and then floated and um, there are a number of ways that uh, satellite data can be used to see um, not just the bad things, but also a lot of the really pretty and good things. Yeah. Other questions? No? Okay. So I'm just going to finally talk to you a little bit about some of the cool things I think that NASA has that can engage you if you're interested. Have you all heard about citizen science? Does anybody know what it is? No? I would imagine that maybe some of you already participate to some extent um, today, but essentially it's when people go out, you know, they, we leave our house, we go out into the yard, and we start looking at different things that are around us. Um, some people will take a telescope and look out at the planets and the stars, and others want to observe the clouds or the trees or different things around them. All of this helps NASA specifically because our data only tells you so much. It can only get so close. So when you think about the picture of Barbados and Ridgetown, we can see the houses, right? But we can't see an individual person. And so when, when you go out into your community and you tell us about the things that you see, then we can bring, we can match that with the data that we have so we get a clearer picture of what's really going on. It's uh, actually called ground truthing, where we're able to validate what we think we see with satellite data from the data and information that's given by all of you. So if you go on online, um, NASA has a globe observer, and there are different things that they ask you to do. So essentially you can go online and you know, you can look at clouds and tell them about like the shape of certain clouds and that will help them understand whether or not there are certain environmental changes that happen when a cloud looks a certain way. Like rain, right? Like as clouds get higher and more stacked, we know that most likely their precipitation and rain is forming um, and that a storm is coming in. You can be a part of mosquito habitat mapping. Can anybody guess why that might be important? Does anybody have any thoughts? Do you wanna? No? So we care about where mosquitoes live, right? Because when, <clears throat> when they're standing water for a very long period of time, it usually creates uh, the perfect habitat for mosquitoes to form. And mosquitoes, like most insects, rapidly multiply, right? So what can happen is if there is a mosquito that's carrying a particular disease and it's rapidly multiplying, we really want to get a handle or understanding of where the mosquitoes' habitats are located. And so there are ways for us to actually use satellite data to understand where it's likely that the mosquitoes might be living, um, especially following like a storm that's gonna cause a lot of water to be pooled in particular areas. But if we have people like you who go out and can tell us like where they, they see standing water or where different things, um, where it's likely to be, then you give us a better understanding of like how good the satellite data is. You can also look at land cover and trees, and then there are other um, citizen science mess um, activities that you can participate in as well. And we also have a Women and Girls Initiative, which when you go here, you can learn not only how to participate in like different activities that might be occurring in your area, but there are also a number of internship and fellowship opportunities available. So as you're getting through high school and you're looking for um, you know what to do when you before you enter into college there are activities that you can participate in um, both before college and then while you're in college as well and leading up of course to um, a professional career and so I'll just quickly um, and again we have a lot of like stem related activities specifically on these websites so um, 
whether they're puzzles or just learning more about the different women in STEM at NASA, all of these things are available. And we have a large support. I mean, one of the things that was really neat about coming to NASA is that you don't, I think sometimes in college you can be surrounded by a lot of, of scientists that are just boys, right? Just males and um, a lot of time I wasn't really sure because I was the first person in my family to go to college, you know, I didn't really know if I was always pursuing the right path. Um, I mean, I loved it and I thought that that was what mattered. But what's also neat is when you come to NASA, you get to see like how many people are just like you, who have interests, who are able to find a way. Um, and even though I never thought I'd work at NASA, there are a lot of people whose specific goal was to, to work with NASA in different ways. We have, um, uh, actually Sandra Kaufman is my boss. Um, she runs the Earth Sciences Division. She's from Costa Rica. Um, she never, um, also, she she's an engineer. She's helped build um, a number of the satellites that we've talked about today. Uh, the woman in the middle is from Trinidad um, specifically, but throughout NASA, I think we have a really well working, warm and welcoming environment of like promoting STEM in particular. So if I can answer any questions, um, please let me know. It's been really nice talking to you about what I do. Thank you. <laughs>